establish more of an electric vehicle fleet, uh, not just in Florida, but nationally. And um, you know how electric vehicles are disrupting how we plan for transportation because they sure do have a big effect on our traditional funding sources. FDOT has identified as much as a one third revenue loss in the transportation trust fund with the aggressive scenario of how people might adopt electric vehicles. Um, so, you know, as we look out to say 2030 or 2035, that could have some real implications, not just statewide, but also in Pinellas County where most of our transportation dollars are derived from the gas tax. Um, so that's, that's one issue that we're looking at. In terms of the pandemic though, um, I think the, the biggest effects have been on um, social distancing and the effect that that's had on people working remotely, not going into the office every day, um, people changing their uh, routines, their schedules. Uh, we're, see we're not seeing nearly as much traffic in the AM and the PM peak hours, but on a lot of our roadways, some of our interstates, for instance, we are seeing about the same volumes. It's just, you know, that time of day has shifted to where it's not all concentrated uh, in the rush hours. And that certainly has an effect on how we look at congestion and mobility. Um, in terms of our retail uh, in, in Pinellas County in particular, but also everywhere, uh, we all, we're already seeing a decline in brick and mortar stores for certain types of retail. Um, not so much restaurants, but for you know, shopping and clothing and things like that. And all the pandemic has done is just exacerbated that. So we're continuing to see uh, uh, less, less reliance on people driving to a store or driving to an office. And I think that's starting to play out in some of the numbers. So I think it's probably good at this time just to turn it over to Chelsea, let her show you some data, and then we can maybe have a little conversation about what that means for planning and for development and how we respond. You need, right, to, um, you need to change screen, Chelsea? Yes. Yeah, I was just going to say. Okay. Okay. So I think I just gave it to you. All right, perfect. Give me one second to pull it up here. All right, well, thank you guys for having me. Um, I've pulled together some data, some that we are tracking, um, uh, you know, here at Ford Pinellas. And also I've been in some conversations uh, with a, a consulting firm called RSG and they have done some national, uh, nationwide surveying. So I'm gonna share some of that with you today. Uh, first, this graph, it, it, it's pretty complex, but I really just want to draw your attention to the blue line and then the orange line. And the blue line are some of the average traffic um, totals that we saw in Pinellas County in 2019. And the orange line is what we saw in 2020. Uh, so you'll see there's pretty big gap in the April timeframe. And it got a little bit uh, smaller, the gap, as we went through, uh, through, through the course of the year. Unfortunately, this graph only goes to July but I did look at the numbers for November and December and it's pretty similar. It's about a 20% difference in total traffic at certain locations throughout Pinellas County. Uh, this is uh, data from the Florida Department of Transportation and they have some permanent count stations um, on some of the major roads. Uh, so this is really on those big major roads, the differences that we saw year over year in terms of total traffic. Whoa, I do not know what just happened. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> All right, hopefully that- Blame it on that, 2020, yeah. blame it on 2020. <laughs> exactly. Um, so locally, you know, at Ford Pinellas, we do maintain our own count, count program where we go out and we look at about 120 different sites uh, each year and we monitor traffic over time. Uh, because of the pandemic, we decided we'll, we, that's really probably not the best use of our time uh, given uh, the traffic differences. Uh, so what we did is we looked at a total of 32 different sites countywide and we monitored them over a period of three months. We looked at June, July, and August of last year to see what's going on and we could really track those patterns. And what you have up here is the map on your right. Overall, um, traffic remained low. Uh, we did see it start to come back along our beaches as people started to get a little stir crazy. We definitely saw increases going out to our beach locations. Um, but really in those areas around our business districts, the Carillon Center, some of the downtowns, we really didn't see the traffic come back. Uh, in the neighborhood areas, though, this was kind of interesting. 
the traffic really didn't fall off. Uh, and that's because well, with more people working from home, they were, you know, in the middle of the day, they were taking that trip to the grocery store or taking their kids to get out of, you know, get out of the house a little bit. So really those big decreases were gonna be around our, our major areas uh, with the businesses. And then you'll see this one red dot right in the middle of the screen, that's next to a FedEx distribution center. Mm -hmm. uh, and we actually saw significant increases in traffic in that area. And that's again, with people being home, e-commerce, uh, those are really the only areas that we saw significant increases from 2019, everywhere else was a uh, steady drop off. Uh, so this is that survey I referenced uh, that the firm RS&G did. Uh, they started it in May 2020, and they've actually been continuing to do it so that they could uh, look at patterns over time. And this was really about behaviors, uh, feelings towards transportation. Um, and so you can see kind of uh, the, the graphic right there shows the first wave. That's the first wave of surveys that they released and then other waves. You can kind of see how that related uh, to those hospitalized with COVID in different parts of the country. So it's a pretty good representation, I think, of, of feelings towards transportation. Uh, one of the questions asked was about willingness to travel using shared modes. Um, and you can kind of see where, you know, if the vaccine was available, but cases were decreasing uh, and no measures were applied, that means no masks, no social distancing, only about half of the people surveyed would really ride transit. About 57% said that they might take a taxi or a, a TNC, which is like an Uber or a Lyft. And then by air travel, only about 34%. However, if there were some measures, enhanced cleaning masks, things like that, you'll see those percentages jump up. You compare that on the right, where if a vaccine is widely available and there aren't a lot of new cases, you'll see it's even bigger. Um, so this is just really gauging people's feelings about taking transit and, and, and some of those ride sharing companies. It is still lower than what uh, was in 2019. Uh, people are still a little hesitant to get back into some of those shared uh, transit services, but with a vaccine available and few new cases, we do believe that people are going to be feeling more comfortable and we'll probably get back to a more normal pattern in terms of transit and Uber and Lyft use. Uh, so the typical transit behavior, uh, we do believe that while we'll get kind of closer back to where we were, we might not get all the way there. Uh, with frequent transit users, people who you know typically commuted using transit, just a little bit more than half, only 65% had used, used transit in the past week. Uh, and 84% of frequent transit commuters who currently travel to work do so by transit. Uh, but on the right, you'll see that future telework preference. People that have been working from home want to remain working from home for the most part. 70% of those people who used to take transit and are currently working from home said that they wanna to continue to do that for at least four days uh, going into the future. Uh, when, we, when it was looked at uh, telework plans by demographics, uh, this isn't too surprising. Uh, it was broken down by income and also um, by other demographic data. Uh, people that earned higher incomes were able to work from home and also want to continue working from home versus those with lower incomes often didn't have that, uh, that chance. Uh, people that are maybe working in the retail or service sector, teleworking isn't gonna work for those, those kinds of people. Uh, but those that are teleworking, more than 60% of men and women want to remain working from home at least part-time going into the future. So that can have a definite impact on our transportation plans going forward. And looking at teleworking and how likely it is to continue, you know, looking at these survey responses, it really looks like it's gonna be something that's not gonna change much going forward. Uh, that green line, the dark green line that you see at the top, that's the number three. Those are employers of current teleworkers who are likely to continue to allow it. So based on this survey, you know, between 60 and 70% of employers that already allow teleworking are likely to continue to allow that moving forward. Uh, maybe it's not every day of the week. Maybe they'll still have an office presence where people go in a couple days out of the week. Um, but overall, it looks like you know, teleworking is here to stay. Uh, moving away from cars, you know, we're looking at active transportation. It really remained steady during COVID-19. 70% uh, of people ex exercised outdoor at least once in the past seven days, and 70% exercised outside at least weekly during the same month of 2019. 
So there was really a lot of walking and biking going on during the pandemic. And that data really plays out in Pinellas County. Uh, we have trail counters at uh, several different locations along the Pinellas Trail. And that light blue line at the top, uh, that's the 2020 trail counts compared to other years. We saw significant increases in people out on the trail, especially in May. We had 134% increase in May 2020 versus May 2019. And that's really due to, again, people wanted to get out of the house, they wanted to exercise, and they turned to you know, staying local, using our trail facilities. They're out there. Um, so it's great that we have these facilities to provide for them. When we looked at our crash data, uh, this is month over month. Especially in the March, April, May timeframe, we did see significantly fewer crashes on our roadways. And that corresponds really well with, obviously, not a lot, not as many people were driving long distances. Uh, so our crashes did go down. They started to come back, you know, towards the December timeframe. And we also saw some changes in the types of crashes that we experienced. Um, in April, we saw an increase of intoxicated uh, drivers that were causing crashes, and also those that were running controls. Uh, so with fewer cars on the road, uh, you could drive faster, You people were driving more aggressively, and they were running uh, red lights and running stop signs. And that was the biggest increase that we saw in terms of our crashes in Pinellas County. Uh, in June, we saw an increase of 60% of crashes that involved speeding. And you know, we saw a little bit of a decrease of the aggressive driving uh, later on in the year, um, but still we saw those big increases and in people running uh, stop signs or stoplights, causing crashes and also uh, being intoxicated while driving as a result of the pandemic. Uh, so that was just some quick data that I wanted to share with you today. I'm happy to answer any questions where that information came from. We have lots more, but that was just a really high level quick, you know, walk through to, to kind of get you thinking and we're happy to take any questions that you have. I'll default to you, Mayor. I, I keep muting myself. Thank you for that uh, that presentation. And for, I did have a question. You said that uh, in the, the data that 60 to 70% of those who allow telecommuting, employers who allow telecommuting indicated that they would continue to allow that. Does the data say, because I couldn't see it on the slide, does it indicate whether or not those same employers were allowing telecommuting prior to the pandemic? Um, we can dig into that a little bit more. Um, some of them did. Uh, there are There is some information from that same survey that I can I can look up for you. Um, about that, and uh, a lot of those were new, were new telecommuters, or new, sorry, policy, employers with new policies about telecommuting. So once people tried it, they realized, wow, this works pretty well. Uh, I know at Ford Pinellas, we had a very similar experience. Um, it's been going well. Uh, we plan to probably continue some component of teleworking in the future, and I think a lot of other organizations have had the same experience. Great. That would be a really interesting uh, piece of information to understand data-wise, because certainly those who have allowed it before, there's probably not going to be any material impact on on what they're they've been doing. So probably won't impact traffic patterns and planning that much. But of the whole boom of those who suddenly were forced to learn some new disciplines and allow it, if that many of them are in indicating that they're going to continue to allow it. Uh, that, that's, that's pretty significant. So yeah, I'd love to hear uh, if you could find out that information, it'd be interesting. Thank you. Absolutely. If I can't find it, I'll reach out to the firm that did it and I'll have them mine the data for you. We'll, we'll get you an answer. Thanks. And I think to your point, Mayor Seidel, you, you started uh, remote working, what, five or six years ago? Uh, it's now been seven years ago. We wow. closed our offices here in Oldsmar and and, and uh, all of it, we, we don't have a large company, but we have uh, 22, almost 25 employees and uh, they all work remote and have, a, I joked with them, I think I've said it to this group before, when we, when we, uh, when the pandemic first hit, I told them there's two good pieces of news. One, we're not letting anyone go and no one has to take a pay cut. And number two, they can all work from home. So <laughs> they, they weren't impressed with number two, so, but. Yeah, no, it's worked and there's a lot of, you know, the thing with all the working from home and the telecommuting part that, and I, I learned this from doing with our own staff and a micro kind of view of it, 
and that there are some really, I, I envision the need for us to provide some kind of education and maybe it's a chamber uh, task as it relates to, there's this thing known as um, virtual distance, right? And what happens is, is where an employee who is accustomed to being involved in a culture one-on-one, -on -one, they suddenly get this virtual distance from the company and it really requires a lot of extra effort uh, to keep them engaged, to keep them to feel part of a culture. Uh, and I have personally found that it is um, horrible for young adults to be 100% in that virtual uh, realm. And the reason why, it's not because they can't handle the technology. I mean, they're quite frankly much more proficient but it's because they seem to lack that social development that comes from being in a work environment. And we've seen some, uh, you know, over the last seven years where we, we've kind of hesitated, not because it would be bad for us, but just out of the fear that it might be bad for uh, uh, a younger person just getting into the workforce, just not to go on a tangent, but it's relevant, right? I can echo that. We hired a new employee, a young adult uh, at the end of April and she's our communications manager. And uh, she's done a great job. Uh, but I think for about six months, I was really thinking, you know, am I gonna have to extend her probationary period? <laughs> you know, we were really questioning whether we made a good decision. Uh, and it just took longer for that culture and um, sense of how you work with your coworkers to really kick in. And after about a year now, almost, um, it's kicked in. But uh, it was it was nip and tuck there for a little bit, just because of what you suggested. So I think you're definitely onto something. Well, and to, and to that point, I, I mentioned before some of you got on the call, my brother, after 40 years working in Chicago in the city and riding the L and mass transit, you know, they he works for an ad agency in Chicago or did. Um, and it really um, became troublesome to him uh, working from home. The commute from the bed to the couch uh, really weighed on him. Uh, and he he wound up quitting and he's moved to St. Petersburg and he's going to try and do something down there. But I think, I think you have some of the young people that are enjoying it. And I, I think we were on a call last month talking about, you know, is the, is the eight hour day now going to become a four hour day because, or a six hour day because people are maybe more productive and how do you measure it? And the younger millennials or uh, what do you, what they call them? Pre-millennial or post-millennials, uh, you know, they like their social time. They might work from five in the morning to eight in the morning and then, you know, go ride a bike or go surfing. And, and so I think, you know, that's going to change and the business community is going to have to figure out how to, me how to measure that, you know, and, you know, we, we equated it to, we had somebody from a machine shop on and, you know, they go to the book, you know, an oil change takes two hours and that's what you could charge. But if your guy can get it done in an hour, you know, is that going to ever work its way into the, you know, into the workforce. And Mayor Seidel, you might, I mean, maybe you have that from a production standpoint, you know, is there set parameters and hours for people when it comes to that? There are, and, I, and I'll tell you, I see Jones on the call, who is an, an expert in the employment area, but I will tell you one of the things we wrestled with a long time ago, who I've shared with a lot of my peers who have since gone to remote is, do not forget, even though you might have employees who are motivated and they want to log in early and they want to stay late and all of those employment rules do not go away. Um, you know, we literally, I, I'll tell you a real quick story. We had an employee who's terrific, hard worker, and um, we had to turn off, we had to make a decision, either let her go or turn off her access after she was no longer supposed to be working because it didn't matter how many times they told her, listen, you cannot do that, okay? We're not, we're not authorizing overtime, it's not necessary. She would still log in. And you know, she did it, she, she was doing it for the, you know, the good of the cause, but we finally like it got to that point. And uh, you know, there are certainly other things that I, I, I'll tell you, when I, we first went and they probably have much better, uh, much better statistics for it today, but when we first went to virtual and attempted to just have that discussion as it related to 
um, you know, workers comp and those types of things. You know, we, we struggled, uh, you know, to, to try to get the right rating and, and those types of things. So it, it certainly has a, a, a wide impact, which is will really be interesting to see how many stay in this mode. And, you know, I could tell you for ourselves, uh, you know, we're working on building a small downtown here in Oldsmar. And uh, we originally were looking at a lot of it to be commercial space. And we've kind of pivoted from that uh, and are looking more at residential units uh, for density purposes, uh, because we, we, you know, we think like everybody else that uh, some of the commercial space that we had envisioned, uh, because there's not a lot of, you know, uh, a, a type uh, office buildings here, which was what really the goal was, we think the space, uh, like a lot of experts in the field, it may not be quite the demand that there was prior to the pandemic. So it certainly has uh, rippled through. And, and to that point, Witt or Chelsea, I'll ask this question. How do you see uh, long term this affecting, you know, there are certain parts of and, and Commissioner Flowers and, and Commissioner Eggers and Charlie, if he's still on here, how do you see um, the employment centers changing? Because, you know, you had the um, Omerton Road um, area that was a big employment center. Oldsmar has a big employment center. Do you, it's a two part question. Do you see that changing? And I think Commissioner Eggers can speak to this personally because of his stepdaughter. How is it going to, how is it going to affect people's home buying habits? And, you know, I know Dave has a, a case where somebody might be moving across the country because they're never going back to work or anytime soon, not back to work, but physically back to the office. Well, I, I'll just start from our perspective. Uh, it will affect how we plan and how we look at industrial and an, an office space. But, you know, the reason Pasco County hasn't attracted all the manufacturing jobs that they wanted to is because there is this concept called affiliation where, you know, you're, you're proximate to your suppliers, your competitors. It's why there's a, a Walgreens and a CVS on the same corner. And that applies to manufacturing and employment uh, uses as well. Folks want to be in that uh, 126th Avenue, US 19, 118th Avenue, Olmerton Road area because there are so many suppliers and complementary businesses that are in that vicinity that makes it more efficient. And those people are still largely coming to work. They're not the same kind of folks who have the remote work set up. That's not Carillon. You know, Carillon's a different story. Um, so we're seeing just from our market analyses that there's a greater demand for residential than there is for, for office or employment-based uses. Um, the county just completed a US-19 corridor market analysis and um, it reaffirmed what we found in 2017 when we did a similar study that um, residential demand, uh, particularly rental residential demand, is much higher uh, and can fit into a smaller footprint than some of the employment and, uh, and office uses. So I think we're gonna continue to see that trend in Pinellas County. Um, and then we're also seeing pressures throughout the county on traditional warehouse and, uh, and uh, employment manufacturing space that's being um, looked at for repurposing to a whole range of things. We have the Raytheon property in South um, County in the St. Pete area that's coming forward as a land use case this month where they're looking at, um, out, uh, they're looking at recreation and housing, uh, it, replacing that. Uh, and in the Deuces Live neighborhood, we have um, a warehouse arts district area that's being looked at for residential and mixed use with um, like craft maker space. Um, so we're just seeing some differences from what we've been known to expect over the last 5, 10, 15 years. Interesting. And I know, Commissioner Eggers, you may know, being the former mayor of Van Eden, but I've talked to uh, Mayor Bajowski and maybe Mayor Seidel. I know they're trying to maintain that Coca-Cola uh, plant in Van Eden as a, you know, some kind of a manufacturing, um, but I don't know how that I don't know how that is going. I know Coca-Cola controls it, so I don't know what the city can do, but you know, I think that's similar to what Witt's talking about. You're seeing repurposing of, of some of these industrial manufacturing areas. Yeah, I, I, I think that some of those um, 
some of those warehouse uses that you're still going to be in play big time. I mean, you're not going to be able to work from home on a lot of those types of those kinds of jobs. And you're still going to have a lot of that going on. I, I think there's going to be some of this pendulum swinging clearly away from in office use uh, and more at home. It'll come back some for sure. It's interesting though, we, I mean, at the county, we're just in the very beginning stages of, of doing some like strategic thought process on where we want our, our office building to be, you know, in the next five years or so. So you're, you're, you're starting to talk about all of the things that you all have been talking about, you know, and so, you know, how much space are we going to need? What's that space going to look like? Is it just going to be ports where people can come in and work one day a week or two days a week? Or um, so are we going to, you know, are we going to design for 100,000 feet or maybe only 40 or 50,000 feet? Um, so I'm glad we're at that end of the, uh, at that end of the process, because I mean, there's, there are the consultant that's with us is reaching out across the country to see those kinds of trends. It's, it's a big deal. It's a huge difference. Um, Carillon, which is almost 100% office, is going to have a major shift in adjustment uh, down there. So, um, you know, uh, I think city of Dunedin just finished their, their whole plan, their whole new building a plan for downtown Dunedin. And that was all done pre-COVID. So, you know, it's like, do you, you, you start from scratch? And I, I think you probably ought to, because if we're hearing what, we're, what we think we're hearing, it's gonna be a dramatic reduction in, in the amount of space. So, I, I mean, it, it, there's a lot of that going on around a lot of office users for sure. But um, yeah, it's something that's definitely with us. You had a speaker at the, your meeting last month, Doug, that talked a little bit about the, the demographics of the, of the, you know, the millennials and the post millennials and what they're expecting. As our, our, our organizations are getting older, they're over our average age, I think in Pinellas County government, it's over 50 years old. So we're going to have to start back filling with younger people. They're going to have a lot of opportunity for quick growth in their positions, but they're going to be a lot of those demanding. I want to work at home. So you're going to hire me or are you going to hire some, you know, so that those all, that, all that's coming into play big time. So real yeah, time. And, yeah. And to your point, Commissioner Eggers, that was a very interesting uh, speaker that we had that talked about, you know, the post millennials and, and Whit might know more about this from a, a social part being in the planning side, but you know, what did he say that, you know, they want these jobs, but they only want them for a year, year and a half because they want to continue to, unlike the, the lifers that you see, I mean, I, I work for three different companies, but I never changed desks over 25 yeah. years because I kept getting acquired. That's, that's the exception, not the rule. And you're seeing people, right. You're, and you're seeing uh, for the last conversation we had where they're, you know, a year, year and a half and, you know, they want to advance, 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 make more money, make more money. And, you know, that's probably has some effect on the, the workforce as well. Yeah, no, no question. But I do think a lot of our, our organizations are aging. Um, the average ages are older, so there will be opportunities for quick advancement. So you might be able to get that group into a, a longer term that they wouldn't normally be. So we'll see. We'll see how it plays out. I think we're really seeing a, a change in how people make decisions within organizations. Um, and, and that's the dynamic of how people are working together. So you know, it used to be you got upper management into a room together and, you know, they would talk about things, make decisions, maybe reach out to a few employees. Well, now it's just so much more, it's much more collaborative. People are easier to um, just access and, uh, and connect. And I think it's disrupting how traditional uh, companies have made decisions. Um, and I can speak from my work in the private sector and now in the public sector. Uh, it's, it's created an environment now that's much easier to be collaborative uh, than it used to be. And I think that's because the optics are not, well, who's going into the room? Who's behind the closed door? Uh, the optics just aren't the same. And I think that's a good thing. Um, and we're hoping, at least with our agency, that we're gonna rely a lot more on surveys and what employees are thinking and how, they're, how comfortable they are as we move forward with new decisions. In fact, this whole pandemic of working remotely we surveyed our entire staff twice just to find out um, 
you know, what difficulties they were having, what equipment they needed. Um, are you comfortable coming back into the office? And if so, under what conditions? And we're probably gonna stay working remotely for a good long time. And as far as the space planning goes, maybe reconfiguring our space needs so that we have places to meet because we still need to meet with the public and our committees. So that's really critical. But as far as personal office space, we're not valuing it that much anymore. And that's what we told the, the county's consultant. Um, we'd be probably fine if we could just give people a space that they can go and treat it like a hotel for a day and then leave and go back. And I think that would probably work for most of our employees. And maybe not in the smaller companies. I think Mayor said, oh, you're, you know, 2025, it probably isn't as effect, big of an effect. But in the beer companies, how much do we see that the, A, the lack of water cooler talk might affect um, moods and, you know, and, and work, work ethic, but also the one that concerns me sometimes, and I think my son-in-law, they both, my son-in-law and daughter both work from home for different companies, but I think he got caught up in out of sight, out of mind, you know, um, and you're, you're just a number, especially in the bigger companies, you know, they're looking at production and, you know, you're not at the water cooler talking. And I, I got to think that that's going to have some effect, you know, on the business. I can't quantify that, but I think you're right. Um, it, it, just like with onboarding our employee, it was not easy for her to not have people who could just drop by her cubicle or where she could wander around and chat with people and kind of get a sense of, of the culture. So it is a little different, but also people get in trouble sometimes with water cooler talk, right? So <laughs> with, with, with Zoom and Teams, you know, you're being, you're on. Um, I think it leads to a little more professional conversations consistently. Um, so, I, you know, it'll be interesting to see in three to five years if folks do some research on this period and, and what's changed. I think there'll be a lot of interesting findings. Commissioner Flowers, you're, you're new to the, to the County Commission and welcome from all of us here in Oldsmar, as, as uh, Mayor Seidel said, but what are you seeing down in, in St. Pete? That's a pretty heavily uh, uh, employment center down there. And what are you seeing and hearing down there? Um, I'm trying to be very cautious because we have a number of things coming before sure. us on the sure. commission. And sure. I have two other commissioners here. I will tell you that um, Pinellas Technical College is doing a really good job, even despite COVID-19, with not only enrolling people in technical trade programs, but actually graduating those persons and finding employment for them, which um, brings about some issues regarding transportation out to some of those sites and locations. Sure. Um, but that's something that happens all over, you know, the ability to get to work on time is not that we don't have transportation, it's how those cycles run to be able to get from South St. Pete out to the Carolina Center area, or to be able to get to the commuter transport, to be able to take the 300X over to Tampa, maybe to go to another hub for some of the construction that's going on over there. Um, Small business uh, development is moving slowly, but it's moving. The CRA um, has helped with that, but I think there needs to be some adjustments in um, just who actually qualifies for the CRA. And it's very interesting when um, the mention of the arts warehouse district um, along the 22nd Street and Fifth Avenue South Corridor, because that is a district that's doing well on the Fifth Avenue South side, but that same forward push cannot be seen once you get to Emerson going um, south on 22nd Street. So um, I look forward to some of the further discussions. I'm going to kind of stop it there because I don't want to say yeah, no, something that may get, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that will be discussed later within um, the county commission. But um, I do love the fact that, um, you know, when I go to Dunedin, when I go to Oldsmar, Safety Harbor, you know, just seeing some of those communities, thinking about where they were some years ago, you know, not the hustle and bustle. And now when you go, you know, it's that hustle and bustle and they go through their transitions also, but just to see um, those business corridors coming back um, and support it, I think is really, really good. And we need to maybe keep that in mind when we're talking about forward Pinellas, making sure that we 
Um, I'm not saying that we are, but making sure that we always keep those smaller communities um, and our unincorporated areas like Lelman, um, keep them, you know, as a part of the whole discussion. Um, because if we're not careful, we can sometimes plan around them and they miss out on that forward push rather than receiving the benefits. So, yeah, and, and I think I mentioned that to, I think I mentioned that to Witt about how the, the commuting circle, you know, while it still exists, it may be morphing into something else because it does, you know, you're now, you're like you said, what you're working from home, but you're running, you know, a mile to the, to the grocery store as opposed to, you know, 20 miles to work. So, um, I see that's going to change. And Christy's on here. I'm sure gas consumption is probably up at home, you know, from people working from home and doing laundry while they're there and, and all that. I'm sure you're seeing some change in that, too. Yeah, we've seen some increase. But then, of course, you know, with the hotels and the restaurants, when they shut down, that really the consumption went down. So we kind of got it from the residential market yeah. versus the commercial market. And we keep track of our um, interruptible custom customers, which are big ones like, um, um, oh, I can't even top of my head. The Church of Scientology's usage has gone down. They're our number fifth customer. Uh, Bay Cares have, has obviously gone up because of hospitaliz hospitalizations. But um, yeah, it's, and you know, being a private, <laughs> being an enterprise department owned by the city of Clearwater and trying to be a Tico people's gas, but working under the bureaucracy of um, the city. Um, the telecommuting policy wasn't very well recept received by certain upper staff. And so we had to sign a policy and being available. And if you didn't have the assets at home to do your job before the, um, before the pandemic hit, then you weren't allowed to work from home. Hourly employees are not allowed to work from home. There's um, a certain number of people from the gas department alone that can work from home. And I know different departments have different ways, but you know, most of us on this call, if not all of us, we're all professionals. And not one person can tell me that on Sunday night or Saturday morning when they get back from kickboxing like me, check their emails and, you know, oh, you know what, I'm gonna forget this if I don't send it now. And so it's kind of working from homes. The only thing about it is I, I, hope, I hope the commissioners and the other ladies on the call will laugh, but I don't wear as much makeup anymore. I mean, my foundation, my lipstick, I mean, I just put lipstick on for y'all when I looked at my face on the screen, I was like, oh, I need some lipstick on. But um, this silly things like that, that have you realize have gone down. Like you said, your energy consumption at home might've gone up. But like Melissa Satius, you know, with Duke, who was our new president of Duke Energy for the state of Florida, love, love me some Melissa. I mean, her whole staff has been working from home a, a year ago this week. So they haven't been to the office at all and everything's remote. So their community relations and they're doing the Zoom calls or showing up at the big C meetings or whatever. But it's, um, it's really different to me how some companies are handling their sales staff and their community people versus the people that have to report here. You know, our 24-hour dispatch, we have to have someone here physically. When there's a gas leak, we have to physically have guys in the field fixing that leak. So it, it's definitely been a learning curve. But I can tell you this, the freshman 15 ain't got nothing on the COVID-20. <laughs> I think we lost Doug. We may have. Um, I, something that um, uh, Commissioner Flowers mentioned uh, is relevant to what we've been talking about here, and that's Pinellas County is uniquely situated. It's different than Hillsboro or Pasco or many counties in Florida, where which which are dominated by one central business district, and we've got all these twenty four uh, cities, but we've also got Lelman and and Ridgecrest and other parts of unincorporated county, Palm Harbor, which really function is like a 20 minute neighborhood. And the idea that if you're not commuting a longer distance for education or job, most of you can accomplish your activities within a 20 minute travel time. And that's generous. I mean, that's 20 minutes by bike um, and, uh, or walking. Uh, by car, it might be five or 10 minutes. And I think we really are naturally physically laid out that way. 
Uh, and so communities, whether it's Lelman or whether it's High Point, uh, we need to work on those communities to make sure that they have lighting, that they have sidewalks, that they have connectivity, that they have uh, access to businesses. Uh, because at least for me, I live right near Safety Harbor. I don't need to go more than a mile away to solve you know, 95% of most of my, my needs. And so I bought an e-bike to do that. And um, that extends my range. I don't sweat uh, and I don't have to drive my car. Um, but those are expensive and they're not for everybody. So we need to look at this from an equity lens. We need to look at it from, you know, what types of businesses and um, um, uh, local um, help uh, can we provide to people in certain communities. Um, and that 20 minute neighborhood, I think can be a real game changer for folks. You know, what you all may have seen that I, I read this morning where um, I guess Brightline thinks that it'll be um, providing service in Tampa by 2025. That's not really that far away when we think about it. You know, that's really not that far away. Um, and so what that resonated for me is an even greater urgency to make sure that we are continuing to support and maintain T. Barta and um, um, the planning council, because those will be the vehicles by which to coordinate and draw down those additional dollars and to create hubs, you know, so that persons who are traversing can, you know, move from those hubs out into wherever it is that they need to go. Um, so anyway, just thought I'd throw that in. Mm -hmm. Well, like I said, I think we lost Doug. I was trying to text him to see what happened. Um, you know, it's, I, I would say 2020, but it's not 2020 anymore. So we can't, we can't keep doing that. Uh, and, and, Somewhere and, along the way he transferred it to Joan. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. It was a, definitely an upgrade for Doug. I'll tell you that right now. But uh, so I get to take over now. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like to, I, I'll tell you what. I'll I'll just kind of step in and, and help wrap it up uh, uh, as a member of the chamber and and uh, waiting for a text from Doug to to ask me to do so. Uh, hey, I do want to say one thing that's kind of off subject uh, as we kind of wrap up. And uh, it's kind of one of the benefits of, of being part of this group. And, and uh, I do want to just comment a little bit on, as many of you have seen in the media, uh, the Oldsmar uh, water plant was hacked last month. Um, I will say this, that some of the information that's been reported by the media is not precisely accurate. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of in that situation where we're working very closely uh, in a very active investigation with the FBI and the Secret Service, and of course with the Sheriff's Department. Uh, all of it have been tremendous assets, I, I'll, I'll add. Um, but I will say this, just for those of you who, who either have friends or live in the city of Oldsmar and, and use our water, um, the, the remote access tool that was hacked, uh, we disabled that day and it remains disabled. Uh, we've adopted other policies and protocols so that we are not connected to the internet at all anymore. Um, and uh, what, I, what I would say to everybody, uh, I've learned a lot more about water plants in the last 30 days than I've, I've cared to, but I will tell you that it's a very common practice uh, for water plants to use remote access tools uh, to help people in the field make adjustments the settings. And it's a, it's a discussion worth having. Uh, Oldsmar does not run an, a, an old plant. It's a new plant. It's eight years old. It's very high tech uh, and, and so forth. It had multiple security systems built in. Uh, there was never a threat to anyone's water. It didn't even get to the first backup. I mean, our monitoring protocols were followed and immediately uh, uh, identified that someone had tampered with a dial. But we're what's known as a, a level two plant. Uh, so we're kind of, there's a one, a two, and a three. So we're actually kind of in the middle of that. And uh, you'd be surprised at some of the plants that actively use remote access and the very same tools that we were using. And so I think it's a good discussion. I'm not happy that it happened here in Oldsmar 
of course. I'm glad that our team did as they were expected to do. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to share that. I'd, I'd share more detail, but I can't, uh, you know, uh, but just rest assured that uh, that kind of uh, um, infrastructure is hardened and uh, we don't anticipate there being a, a, another event, uh, certainly, and, and, and all that good stuff. So, hey, I want to uh, thank Witt uh, for, uh, and his team for sharing with us today. I think it was good information. Uh, yep, give them a virtual applause. And uh, all of you for making the time. Uh, we appreciate having uh, you know, three county commissioners here. And I see that uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Dan Siraki joined us, a council member from Oldsmar. Uh, so I had to watch what I say, just like everybody else, right? And so <laughs> in any event, uh, if there's not any other thing for the good of the order, um, is that it? That's all right. Well, listen, everyone have a great day. Okay, thank you once again. Thank, thank you. you.